Well, this is exciting. I have so many questions. I almost don't know where to start because okay. the fashion world, so first of all, thank you so much for joining us. But it's the fashion pleasure. world is really at the thick of it when it comes to sustainability and trying to do better because it has been historically also one of the most polluting in terms of how much water you use, how much energy, how much transport. So what do you think has been the turning point? There's suddenly a conscience in yeah. fashion and luxury. Absolutely. Yes, I completely agree with you. Um, it's been a challenge, but I think what's really important is everybody has come together to realise just the importance of the planet. And the way we work together, I think, as an industry now, I think success comes from approaching this, not just as individual companies, but also approaching this you know, across the industry and across other industries as well. So we're involved in a number of organisations that are pursuing that level of interest. And, you know, our, our history, we go back over 160 years. And uh, just over the last five years, we set very, very stretching climate change targets. And we've either met or beaten all yeah. of them. So fantastic change. So, Julie, what was the turning point where you said, actually, I want to be aggressive with my emission targets. I want to be aggressive with what I want to do. Is it to have a leader role within the fashion industry or did it come from a personal want? Um, it came, probably came from both. So I think it came from a number of people in the organization who said this is, this is just so important. But also it came from the belief that we wanted to lead the industry. I think um, in, within fashion, the luxury brands have a golden opportunity because their products have longevity and the supply chains are very well established. They have got a golden opportunity to lead the industry. And I think also um, the impact you can have on consumers so if you see what a fashion company can do with the desire for sneakers, as an example, and the, and the, the generations that we influence through social media, digitally, et cetera, you can make a real impact on consumers. So we actually wanted to take a leading position. And more recently, we've actually taken a position where we want to be climate positive yep. by 2040, which is the first company, a luxury fashion company, to take such a position as that. So what would make your life easier? What would make sustainability easier, maybe your life harder? Do we need common rules to make sure that we're measuring the things correctly from one company to the other? And why are we still in 2022 actually lacking that database? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a key, key question. I mean, in some ways, because this is quite new in terms of measuring, particularly scope threes, um, it's quite new. So I think inevitably companies are learning and I think we should always sort of bear that in mind that the key thing is to get on the journey, measure what you're doing and then start to disclose what you're doing. And the more actually with the IWSB, the more regulators can actually support that journey to allow people to report on a consistent basis, I think the better. So I think this is a big change this last 12 months and hopefully the next 12 will be a big change in bringing about consistency. But even without that, I think it's really important just to start the measurement process. And, you know, we've had really good data in scope one and two, and we've got a third party that we work with for scope three. And I think as the previous speakers mentioned, that's really important because like over 90% of our emissions are coming from scope three. So you've got to influence all the way down the value chain raw materials, manufacturing, distribution, all the way through to make a difference. But how hard is that when you're such a big company with supply chains that have been there for a long time? And also, if you're making a bag with the you know, Savoir Faire, it's, it's difficult to find someone else if they're not doing what you want them to. Um, it can be at the beginning. It can be. Um, but I think, I honestly think the world has changed. The world has really woken up to the importance of this. And, and we work with all our partners, all our supply chains, all the way back to farmers and herders about you know, responsible farming and ensuring that soil is regenerated because obviously it captures carbon. So it's that sort of circularity message. And we do wellbeing training programs with the, you know, the majority of our, our suppliers so that we can make the change happen and we can move in partnership. Because I think it's absolutely true that where fashion companies, we compete on product and we compete on customer service, but we should never compete on planet. We should work together on planet. And it's absolutely the same with our supply chain. How hard is that to do where, you know, four weeks into a war, raw material prices have gone up, inflation's everywhere, including, you know, the cost of shipping things. So how, do you worry that it will distract actually from the important work on sustainability? 
It, it's an interesting question, actually. And first of all, the situation in Ukraine is a really difficult situation. Um, in some ways, I think it actually makes it more important um, because you've got you've both got the social conscience as well as the environmental conscience, as well as the human and humanitarian conscience. So I think it, in some ways it's a bit like COVID. Originally when COVID occurred, every company thought about how they were going to survive a major pandemic, but quickly pivoted towards how do we make ourselves stronger? How do we make ourselves more sustainable? And I think, you know, with the recent events in Ukraine, it can probably only strengthen that message overall. And it's interesting what you say about inflation and cost. What we're actually finding is that although some things are more expensive to do, if you do them in a sustainable way, it actually, I think, overall is economically beneficial. So if I take an example, um, we, we manage sell-through of our product. So what we buy and what we sell through to our consumers. And actually, that causes you to look at things from both a financial point of view, but alongside it, a sustainability point of view. And actually, if you've got both of those levers, you can actually save money. Although it may cost you more at the outset, you can save money by being more thoughtful in the buy and getting better sell-through. So all the time, I am constantly joining finance with sustainability metrics in everything we, could, we do. Can I give you another example? Yes, please. I love examples. Yeah, uh, another great example is um, capital appraisals. Mm -hmm. So we always used to look at our capital appraisals on commercial and financial grounds, you know, what were the economics around the store. But when we did the sustainability bond, and this was, again, we made a stand. We were the first luxury fashion company to do a sustainability bond. This required investment in stores, you know, using a green approach. And so what we did is now alongside the financials, we look at actually, you know, what is the store in terms of its emissions? And we always now aim for, for either LEED or BREEAM top standards. And so finance and sustainability are hand in hand with an equal place at the table with all major decisions we take in terms of but our network. That's been a shift, right? And I love that. That's I, I been mean, a shift. You've done this green bond. I think last week was there was also a rhinoceros bond, and that got a lot of people going. So talk to me about your bond, and are you expecting to issue a lot more? Who, you know, who are the main investors interested in this? Yeah, I mean, all the top investors were at the table with the, with the sustainability bond. And actually, we, uh, we were eight and a half times oversubscribed. So there was a huge amount of interest, you know, all roadshows all day relating to it. And all the major houses were invested and actually wanted to invest more. We only wanted to do 300 million. We could have done over a billion. It was, was quite significant, the level of interest in it. And I think it does make a difference, both when you've got investors in line, regulators in line, companies in line, industry, uh, and the media. This is when you make a difference, um, you know, to the whole environment. What's your biggest challenge? So if you look at, I mean, there, yeah. you must have, I don't know if it's climate skeptics or, or, you know, shareholder that says, well, why are your margins not, you know, bigger? That's what we want to focus on or, or people that you have to get on board. What's the, you know, what's the easiest thing to change and what's the hardest longer term? Yeah, I think, I think the, um, obviously you've got the financial pressure in a, in a PLC environment. You've always got the margin and the growth pressure. But I think you can work it so that you can actually get benefit from sustainability, as we talked about. Um, I think the biggest challenge, certainly I found, is, is the data. And as you say, consistent, consistency of data and, and actually getting a really good grip on that data because it's, it's critical to be able to get that, to set the targets, to measure performance, and then to actually ensure you're achieving your ambitions. And what we found certainly is our own operations, scope one and two, I mean, we will be carbon neutral uh, this year in our own operations, which is a major achievement from where we were before. Um, but the scope three, you are dealing with people who are not yeah. within your organization. So it's a little bit unlike financial information, whereas financial information is all in your own organization and you've captured it at source. Um, with scope threes, you're relying on the value chain all the way down to the raw material providers. And that brings a challenge with the data. It can put people off because they can say, this is too uncertain. How do we set targets? How do we measure it? How do we disclose it? But on that one, I would say never let trying to be perfect be the enemy of the good. Just start it, 
use third parties if you need to, to try and get a good grip on the data, and then really move forward and set very ambitious targets. The climate positive goal, because it's a really powerful headline goal, has shaped the way we approach it in the entire organization. So we've got the board are in, involved, the executive committee are involved, the heads of the functions are all involved, and even down to, you know, we've got retail champions on the ground level, in the stores, looking at waste in the stores. And it, it's phenomenal. And Sloan Street, which is How do you is choose our, them? So they're like the, the sustainability police? Yeah, yeah. And so you've got it all over the organization. I mean, they are, I think, naturally inclined. So we choose people who are just passionate about this, this area. And then we train them to be able to make a difference. Like it, what? Like, I'm sorry, you haven't recycled that or, yes. or things like that? I mean, that's exactly what they say. They say, you know, we've got an issue over here. Or they come up with ideas about whether it's garment carriers, whether it's packaging. So it's actually on the ground as well as from the top of the company, you know. Um, for you know, the, the initial change, so scope one and scope two, what changes did you have to implement? And again, what were the easiest ones and the hardest? Yeah, I think in terms of scope one and two, it was first of all galvanizing support from our own organization. So it always starts, I think, from the top, this type of thing. Um, and then I think in terms of once we did that, it was engaging things like the capital appraisal process, the store network, so store emissions, thinking about store emissions. When we built Sloan Street recently, we refurbished Sloan Street, our, one of our flagship stores, the first flagship actually that Burberry's done in a new concept. What we actually found was like, you know, there's, there's waste generated from a building and 95% of the waste generated from the building has been recycled. So that comes really from your own operations and you can influence that hugely by having the right tone from the top and engagement through the organization and then in terms of you know using renewable energy has been a big factor in that the store network the office buildings are big factors in this how difficult is it to change some of the materials so i know you yes. mainly work with natural ones but yes. they need to be washed they need to be washed like four times the actual process of, of making beautiful luxurious things is energy intensive. It is. It is absolutely. It is absolutely true, and I think there what we what we did, and and you know credit to the team that were involved in this five years ago. Um, what we did is we set out to have all of our products with what we call positive attributes, mm -hmm. and we had a target of um, eighty percent of the products would have, would have you know at least two positive attributes. So what do you mean by that? Is the question. So one is they can be made in facilities with renewable energy, they can be made from recycled fibres, or they can be made by workers who have wellbeing programmes, so the sort of social and environmental piece. And we set this target five years ago, and we're going to smash the target, <laughs> absolutely smash the target. So we're going to have most of our products having one, two, mm -hmm. potentially more of these positive attributes. So that's come from, again, clarity from the beginning, setting ambitious goals, and then monitoring and follow up with the team and engaging the organization. Julie, there's an interesting conversation about how you set goals. So if you're over ambitious, you could miss them, but then you, you get closer to, to those goals. Yeah. If you're not ambitious enough, then I guess it boosts morale because you say, oh yeah, we're doing a great job. Yes. But then you could go further. So what's the right way of looking at targets for a company? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I think with this, with climate change, we can't waste time. I think we've just got to move, <laughs> we've got to move now. And I think the more ambitious goals you set in this field, the more you stretch an organization to achieve them. And I think in certain industries, that's the only way to make change happen now, uh, because time is of the essence. So I would, I would just advocate, and I think with climate change as well, if you do set an incredibly ambitious goal, and you slightly miss it. I don't think it's a major issue. It's not like missing a financial target with the stock market, for example. It's a little bit more flexible because I think people are just genuinely trying to learn, trying to do the best, and try, trying to work in unison with other members of the industry and other members of business community. How difficult is it, you know, once you have these targets, to make sure that also the consumer, the person that, that purchases it, understand what's behind it? And do you think it actually makes a difference to the way people shop? Yes, I think, I think this is an evolving area, for sure. So, 
Um, it's interesting now that we do regular research with our consumers and we're now finding that the younger generations actually almost three quarters of them are thinking about sustainability when they're buying a product, which is, I think, a really big step forward. Um, but I think what's also important is not just that they are moving, and it's interesting, the younger generation are moving more quickly, you know, than the baby boomers and, and et cetera, and Generation X. So it's good that they're all moving, but then again, I think we've got a role in moving people to be on this journey of climate change and thinking about the products that they buy because they can make change happen. So for companies that are slower in the industry to move, the consumer can push them along. The ones at the front of the industry and in trying to bring about change, we work with a number of our peers on various initiatives like the Apparel Impact Institute you can, and, and the Fashion Pact. You can actually make change happen by influencing consumers. So I, I think don't let's underestimate what we can do to change how they feel and think. And I was going to ask, actually, in the fashion industry, do you share trade secrets to become more sustainable? Or is it still, you know, would you tell a competitor something that you're doing to encourage it? Or, or is it not still the done thing? It's, I mean, we obviously don't share trade secrets. No, not, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> otherwise, the legal team will be a little bit concerned. <laughs> um, but what we definitely do is we do see this environmental peace and the planet, protecting the planet, as a common goal. Right. Um, so whereas we would compete on products, yeah. you know, materials, customer service, etc., buildings, we won't compete on planet. We see it as a common goal. We've actually come together. You know, the Fashion Pact is a great example. We've got 70 members. It's 40% of the sector. So you can make change happen through groups like that. We work with um, Kering and Stella McCartney on a, a group in Italy around changing practices in terms of the leather industry. So we do come together to make change happen. We actually did the sustainability bond as a way of being visible and vocal in the industry in the hope others would, check, would, would also do it and others have done so. Um. And um, so I think this is where we want to stay as a, as a unit. 40% of the industry, what have, I mean, how do you get to 60%? How do you involve more of your yeah. peers to make sure I, that they I also try and make a difference? You've just got to make as much noise as you possibly can. And, uh, and I think through, I mean, I'm involved, for example, with uh, the Prince's Trust. We were talking earlier about uh, the Accounting for Sustainability Network. And that includes people in the fashion industry, but also people outside the fashion industry. And there we share ideas, we share best practice to make change happen. And I think the, the groups, both across business and within the industry, people join. I mean, you act as an advocate, you know, you act as an ambassador, and people join those groups and start to make change happen in their own organization. And what I've found personally, is that finance can make a real contribution to this because we're very sort of operationally involved in the business. We'll tend to run, whether it's resource allocation, whether it's capital allocation processes, whether it's business planning, um, and you can integrate it into what would normally be a financial cycle, and it can bring a lot of power to making change happen. So what, again, what would give it a bit more of a push or to, to spearhead this even more? Is it, you know, pension funds that have to invest 60% into sustainability? Is there something that you yeah. think will we'll see a change in the financial community that will give you know, luxury companies a bit more of an impetus to do it? Yes, I think it, it, it can come from any source, really. I would say, um, I wouldn't say a single source, but I would definitely agree with you. Pension funds, investors, through uh, accounting for sustainability with Prince Charles, we get together regulators, rating agencies, CFOs, CEOs and, uh, and pension funds and private equity. And the more, actually, the more investors focus on this, the more investors say, I want a company that is sustainable, not just great financials, but a company that is sustainable, the more that will engender change. And similarly, consumers, the more consumers care, the more they look at the label. I mean, we've got a big initiative now about traceability. Mm -hmm. So by 2025, again, this is an ambitious target, by 2025, and we're a big organisation, you know, with a 7 billion market cap, by 2025 we're saying all our materials, all the way from raw material, which includes wool, cashmere, you know, cotton, all the way through the value chain, through manufacturing and distribution, it will be traceable to the consumer. So this is a powerful 
hard. It's that, hard. Is that through blockchain? I mean, how do you Yeah, so it? that's one of, yeah. one of the things we use. So it's really, really hard because you're going all the way back to the herder and the raw material supplier at the very beginning of the process. So it's hard. It's not easy to do, especially with a company that's been around for 162 years and has got a very well-established supply chain. But you've... This is the way to make change happen. This is the and way. And you have the technology to be able to do that. We're which building maybe you it. Didn't. We're building, building it. it. We're building it. Yeah. And and you know how far is that away? A couple of years? Less? Yes. I mean, literally, we've set ourselves a goal. You better hold me to this and have me back in three years. <laughs> but we set ourselves the goal of actually doing this by 2025. So it's a date in three years. I mean, <laughs> before then we'll speak. But in three years, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Meg. Yeah. Hi. ESG is such a vast area and that is more volatile than ever. How at Burberry do you ensure that you continue to focus on the issues that are of priority to your stakeholders? Yes, you, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a vast area. Um, and I think in terms of ensuring that it's important to stakeholders, we, we do start from the point of view of what matters to the planet. How can we have the biggest impact on the environment? And then the way we go about doing that is we set very ambitious targets, as we mentioned, climate positive by 2040. And then a subset of that is, you know, metrics around all the major levers, whether it be as simple as our own operations, air travel in our own operations, all the way through to scope three emissions. Scope three emissions for us is a big part of, of, of what we're trying to achieve. And basically, uh, we need to reduce scope three emissions by 46%. So it's a big change to scope three. So by working out what's important, by working out where the emissions are coming from, that's what drives those targets, and that's how we determine the program. Do we have another audience question? Yeah. Um, is, con is a consumer more likely to pay the same price for the same item, irrespective of whether it's associated with high or low carbon emissions, or the consumer shoulder the cost of transitioning with the understanding that it is for the greater good? I think, I mean, this is one of the benefits of luxury. I think luxury consumers will, will pay more for a product that, where they can see the traceability of the product, the authenticity of the product, and the sustainable nature of it, using recycled fibers, for example. Um, if they don't want to pay more, I don't think it's a major issue in some ways, because as we were just talking, Francine, you can actually use work on sustainability to bring about efficiencies in your own organization. You know, we gave the example of the sell-through rates, also stock levels. We are far more careful in the buy when we're buying product in because we think about sell-through, but we also think about waste. And that's where it, the two come together. It doesn't necessarily mean higher prices. It just means deconstructing your supply chain and doing it differently. So for the last question, it actually leads into that question, which is how do you, um, how do you limit waste um, in product and making sure that the supply meets the demand? Yeah, I mean, this is multifaceted. We, we were saying earlier, every single question is, is worth a conference almost. There's so much to this. <laughs> um, but in terms of the, uh, how you eliminate waste, you have got to start at the beginning. You have got to think about the design of the product. Um, the more you can build circularity into the beginning, um, so for example, recycled fibers, the better. So really getting at, getting at it at source saves problems later. And then as you go through, obviously, manufacturing processes, trying to avoid waste through manufacture. And then in, in our business, what we call the, the open to buy, the major buys of the seasons, you know, the four major seasons of the, of the, of the year, that's a key decision point when we're buying product in to sell to our consumers and we'll target these sell-through rates. That means that you have a lot less inventory left over at the end. And we, we again, we're one of the first companies to have a non-destruction of inventory policy. So it means you've got to circularize that at the end of the process as well. And again, we want to be you know, an industry leader in this regard. Julie, I have one final question, very brief one. What's the question you get the most from investors, and has it changed in the last five years? Do they ask you more about sustainability now? They do. It's changed completely. 
It's changed completely. I mean, I've been, I've been with Burberry like five and a half years and I've been a strong advocate of this for quite a while through, through the work I've been doing with the Prince's Trust. And at the beginning, I found it a little bit frustrating that the conversations were very much focused on financials and capital allocation and such like, and little on sustainability. We introduced a six-page handout with some key slides to have not just financial information, but sustainability information alongside it. So we were sort of pushing the information as well as... But what I've seen over the last at least 12 months, two years now, is it's coming up spontaneously in every conversation. And one of the things I really, really appreciate is in doing the bond, the sustainability bond, it brought it to the fore in all of our investors because it's part now of our capital structure and it's part of our balance sheet. So you can't miss it financially. <laughs> More of that, please. But Julie, thank you so much. Yeah.